John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest Americans to ever live, and one of the most controversial businessmen ever. We know him for his well-documented success in the oil industry. Countless documentaries have been made about him, and you'll be hard-pressed to find anyone unfamiliar with the name. To recap, John Davidson Rockefeller was an American titan of industry who quite literally transformed the oil industry, not just in the US, but around the world. Rockefeller was born on July 8, 1839 in upstate New York. Despite being brought up in modest circumstances, he went on to found the Standard Oil Company of Ohio in 1870 alongside his brother William A. Rockefeller and a few other business partners. He was the company's largest shareholder. Just over a decade later, in the early 1880s, Standard Oil controlled 90% of US refineries, oil pipelines, and production. This was after a series of strategic buyouts and mergers which resulted in the umbrella company Standard Oil Trust. Like other rubber barons of his day, this absolute control was won through sketchy means and unethical practices. He famously arm-twisted railroad companies to stop transporting competitor products. Given a choice to retain the bigger customer by dumping the smaller ones, many railroads took that option. Standard Oil controlled virtually every step of oil production and distribution, from the exploration to exploitation to the refining. They controlled the pipelines and even manufactured their own barrels. They were the OGs of vertical integration. By virtue of controlling nearly every stage of the supply chain, Standard Oil simply had no noteworthy competition in the US. One of their strategies to crush potential competition was to outprice them to bankruptcy even if it meant they themselves sustaining losses. Unlike other oil companies, Standard Oil was big enough to cushion against losses by some of its subsidiaries for extended periods. Once the competition was out of business, normal pricing resumed. This practice is today referred to as predatory price cutting or local price cutting when applied only in the specific areas where a competitor operates. Standard Oil maintained this monopoly of the US oil industry until 1911 when it was broken up into seven smaller companies, a few of which remain today. Over the decades, the companies have gone through a series of acquisitions, mergers and name changes, and today they are individually some of the biggest, most profitable companies on earth. Exxon formerly Standard Oil of New Jersey, Mobil, formerly Standard Oil of New York, and Chevron, formerly Standard Oil of California, are all top 20 on the Fortune 500 list. To this day, these companies have some of the highest revenues of any company in the world. Their combined revenue in 2021 was close to 600 billion US dollars. Marathon Petroleum, another big player in the US, was also part of the Standard Oil, it's worth noting that Exxon and Mobil merged in 1999 to form Exxon Mobil in the process of restoring part of the Standard Oil DNA. This followed the merging of Standard Oil of California and Standard Oil of Kentucky a few decades earlier to form Chevron. The story of John D. Rockefeller is often about how he conquered the world with Standard Oil. You would rarely hear about the failures he sustained along the way. One little known failure was his desire to acquire a foreign oil company that is today larger than some of the Standard Oil offshoots. That company is Shell. While Standard Oil quite literally owned the US market, it was not all rosy in other countries. Major European oil companies had emerged, and they intended to dominate the oil market not only in Europe, but the rest of the world outside America. The plan was to effectively shut out Rockefeller from multiple markets before he could even get a foothold. In October 1901, at Standard Oil headquarters in Manhattan, John D. Rockefeller hosted Sir Marcus Samuel, the founder and head of the Shell Transport and Trading Company. The agenda of the meeting was to propose a buyout or merger that would make Shell part of the Standard Oil Company. To understand why John D. was interested in a British oil company, you need to understand what had transpired in the preceding years. Let's turn the clock back to 1890, over 10 years earlier. Fred Shady Lane, a British middleman, is in East London. The purpose of his visit is to present a proposal to a Jewish merchant, Marcus Samuel. 
Marcus is an import-export merchant whose main focus is Asia. He has worked with Shady before, but despite the good business relationship they enjoy, it is not lost on Marcus that his friend's nickname is Shady. So when he told him that Rothschilds, yes, those Rothschilds, wanted to work with him, his skepticism bells could not stop ringing. Although Marcus was successful, he did not consider himself so accomplished as to warrant the attention of one of the wealthiest families to ever live. The Rothschilds controlled much of the banking and investment industry in Europe, and Marcus was just a small-time merchant. Shady explained to Marcus that he had informed the Rothschilds about him and his export business in Asia. It so happened that Alphonse and Edmund Rothschild were sitting on a huge stockpile of oil, and they were seeking somebody who could help them sell it in Asia. Shady told Marcus that he could not think of anyone more capable than the guy who had been exporting to and importing from Asia for years. The Rothschilds, Shady explained, also preferred to work with fellow Jews, and Marcus just happened to be one. Despite his initial hesitation, Marcus eventually got on board. He may not have been an oil person, but he knew shipping, and that was what was needed. In 1893, the Shell Transport and Trading Company was formed with Marcus as its head. The name Shell was an ode to the seashells Marcus had been selling for years. Shipping oil across vast oceans in the 1890s wasn't easy. The shortest and most profitable route to Asia was through the Suez Canal. By then, the British government owned majority shares in the canal, and coincidentally, it had been able to acquire those shares through money lent to it by the Rothschilds. The British government also controlled the day-to-day -day operations of the canal, and they were very particular on what could or could not pass through. One big no was oil tankers. The tankers of the time were not safe and were prone to frequent explosions. Such an accident on the canal would cause untold losses. However, for Marcus, this was just the roadblock. He quickly put the Rothschild's money to use, hiring engineers and designers to create a new oil tanker that would pass all the safety specifications at the Suez. Soon, their design was approved and they could now start minting money in the East. Rockefeller immediately identified this as a threat to Standard Oil's plan for global domination. And as soon as the oil tankers made in voyage, he started bullying and lobbying the British government and politicians to shut down the Shell Transport and Trading Company. He even hatched and executed a nefarious plan to tarnish Marcus's name based on his Jewish heritage, at a time when anti-Semitic sentiments were extremely high. However, despite Rockefeller's money and power, the Rothschilds proved to be a tough nut to crack. The Rothschilds were gracious enough to remind the British government where the money to acquire the Suez Canal had come from. They also pulled the nationalism card, arguing that there was no reason the British government should kill British enterprise because of an American. Rockefeller's plan collapsed, dealing him a rare defeat. Marcus's journey to dominate Asia was now well underway, and his contacts in countries like Japan, Thailand, and Singapore were very eager to work with him on his newest commodity. Since he also owned the only tankers approved to pass through the Suez Canal, their journey was shorter by thousands of miles, meaning there was no way Rockefeller could compete with him on price. At this point, Shell was still a small company, and though Rockefeller kept watch, he was not particularly worried. His reasoning at this time was that despite Shell Transport Company's efficient shipping operation, the Rothschilds simply did not have enough oil supply to challenge Standard Oil long term. One thing that did concern Rockefeller, however, was the many copycat oil companies coming up across Europe. Once Marcus blazed the trail, more Europeans tried their hand at the trade, some even building oil tankers similar to Marcus's for Suez usage privileges. One of those companies was Royal Dutch. It had enough stockpiles to compete with Standard Oil and was also quickly ramping up its European and Asian exports. In 1896, Royal Dutch only exported 5 million gallons of oil. The next year, in 1897, that number tripled to 15 million gallons. That, according to Rockefeller, could not stand because based on his own historical actions, he could foresee a future where Royal Dutch got so big that it started encroaching on his American market. In return to his old playbook, he did. The oil magnate devised a plan to acquire Royal Dutch like he had done with all his home competitors. 
Standard Oil Board did not, however, share John's thinking, particularly because Royal Dutch stock was, in their mind, so overpriced it would cost them a fortune. In early 1897, John surprised the hesitant board with a proposal to acquire Royal Dutch by first artificially bringing down its stock price. If you know anything about Rockefeller, you don't need to be told that this strategy involved some unscrupulous tactics. The plan was to use smear tactics, most significantly spreading word that Royal Dutch oil supply was badly tainted and of low quality. Through the press and word of mouth, the false rumors spread fast across Europe and Asia. Just a year later, in 1898, Royal Dutch stock price had plummeted a mind-numbing 600%. This was music to John's ears, and he was ready to scoop up as much stock as he could, in order to initiate a hostile takeover. However, the Royal Dutch board saw this coming, and in fact all along suspected Rockefeller of being the architect of the false rumors. To protect themselves, the Royal Dutch created a special class of stock that could not be purchased by foreign entities. Holders of this new class of stock were further the only ones who could appoint members to the board. This is a tactic commonly used today, but was almost unheard of then. For example, Google has three classes of shares. Class A shares, held by regular investors, carry one vote per share. Class B shares, held by the founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page, carry 10 votes per share. This means that even when their shares are diluted, the two founders still hold oversized decision-making power. Class C shares are reserved for employees and have no voting rights. Therefore, no matter how much stock Rockefeller bought in the open market, it occurred to him that he could never truly own Royal Dutch. He thus abandoned that plan. Just a couple of years later, in December of 1900, Royal Dutch general manager Jean-Baptiste August Kessler died. The company looked inward for its new leader, finding him in managing director Henri Daterding. In fact, it is said that it was Kessler's final wish that Henri succeeded him. Once in charge, Henri deferred with the company on the issue of a special class of stock. In his mind, the only way Royal Dutch could possibly stave off future acquisitions from the likes of Standard Oil was to grow so big that such an endeavor would be hopeless. To do this, he believed that Royal Dutch should go on the offensive and take over companies itself. Shell, the still relatively small British oil transport company, looked very appetizing to him. However, just like Rockefeller found out in his failed acquisition of Royal Dutch, Henri could not persuade Marcus to sell Shell Transport and Trading Company. Once a buyout failed, Henri reverted to another Rockefeller tactic, crashing the enemy. In 1901, the Royal Dutch boss launched a massive price war against Marcus and his Shell company in a bid to drive them out of Asia. Despite some hesitation in the board, Henri convinced them that Shell was in no position to compete on prices in Asia. He would soon find out how wrong that assessment was, because Marcus was not about to leave a market he all but pioneered. In fact, because of the vulnerable position that Shell found itself in due to Rothschild's low oil supplies, Marcus had the foresight of pivoting from kerosene to gasoline. He had strengthened Shell's position by partnering with producers in, of all places, Texas. This proved very lucrative, and by the turn of the century, he was now actually producing and shipping more than the Rothschilds themselves. By the time Henri and Royal Dutch were launching the Asian price war, Marcus and Shell were in a good position to fight and prolong that war. The quick victory Henri had hoped for was not forthcoming. Soon, both men realized the futility of their price war and the toll it was taking on their companies. They met and discussed ways in which they could collaborate instead. Nevertheless, neither was willing to make any concessions, and soon the talks stalled. In Manhattan, Rockefeller was following events in Europe carefully, and soon word reached them that two men tried and failed to come up with a partnership. It was now his time to strike. Now, back to the 1901 meeting between John D. Rockefeller and Marcus Samuel. The standard oil boss knew that Shell was vulnerable and heavily bruised after engaging in this costly price war in Asia. Although Shell had expanded its oil supply, it was still nothing close to standard oil, a fact that John was kind enough to remind Marcus in this meeting. He proposed a buyout and for the trouble of letting go of his company, John was ready to give Marcus a fair price in fair terms 
including some autonomy in running the subsidiary. He was, however, quickly disappointed when Marcus refused to take the offer right there and then, instead requesting to return to England and think about it. His reasons were more ideological than financial. According to Marcus, selling Shell, a British company, to the Americans could be interpreted as a betrayal to himself, the Rothschilds, and the country. Soon after returning to England, Marcus held another meeting with Henri Dederding of Royal Dutch, who had by now heard of his nemesis's short field trip to the US. Rockefeller's attempt to bring Shell under the Standard Oil banner lit a fire in Henri. He believed that Standard Oil was the only company capable of destroying Royal Dutch, and he was not going to let that happen. Henri saw Rockefeller's courting of Marcus as a call to arms, and he was determined to take defensive and offensive measures. Instead of going with Standard Oil, Henri convinced Marcus to stick with his European counterpart against the common enemy, in a partnership that would eventually produce one of the largest oil companies in the world. The fact that Rockefeller had previously come after both their companies, including orchestrating falsehoods and personal attacks against Marcus, was enough reason for them to join hands. The two companies started with some minor partnerships, which culminated into a full merger in April 1907. The new company was named the Royal Dutch Shell, and today just Shell. It has gone on to become one of the biggest players in the oil and gas industry, dominating production, refining, transportation and distribution in some countries, just like Standard Oil before it. Shell owns oil and gas fields in the US Gulf of Mexico, Nigeria, Canada, Malaysia, Norway, Brazil and many other places. They regularly commission new fields and decommission exhausted ones. The company has operations in almost all countries and brought in revenues of $352 billion and change in 2019 almost a hundred billion more than ExxonMobil and 200 billion more than Chevron. Shell is also heavily invested in green and renewable energy, having interests in wind, hydrogen, solar, geothermal and biofuels. He may have missed out on making Standard Oil even bigger internationally, but John D. Rockefeller was still a very wealthy man. By the time of his death in 1937, his fortune was equivalent to roughly 1.5% of the US GDP. Using that metric today, the amount would be over $315 billion. However, since oil is no longer the dominant wealth creation mechanism today, it is unlikely he would still personally control 1.5% of the GDP if he were alive today. And that's all for this video. Please leave a like and subscribe.